67 million miles from the sun, a small planet moves silently through space in a path that takes it 225 days to go around the sun. Great storm clouds of ammonia, sulfuric acid, and carbon dioxide shroud this planet. The temperature is over 900 degrees. It is far too hot and far too poisonous for life for any biosphere to exist on Venus. 141 million miles from the sun, another small planet takes 687 days to complete its trip around the sun. It has little atmosphere of any kind, with dry ice caps of frozen carbon dioxide around its poles. There is no biosphere on Mars. But in between, a reasonable 93 million miles away from the sun, taking a leisurely 365 and a quarter days to make a trip around the sun, having an atmosphere of one part oxygen and three parts nitrogen with small but important amounts of water vapor and carbon dioxide, having a comfortable range of temperatures between 50 below and 110 degrees above zero Fahrenheit, blessed with a good medium size for a ship in space that is big enough to give a solid feel to objects on its surface, but not so big as to make them oppressively heavy, protected from deadly radiation by a cleverly designed invisible gaseous barrier of ozone gas, and by an equally invisible barrier of charged particles and magnetic fields called the Van Allen radiation belts. Both of these remarkably sensitive and selective in what kinds of matter and energy they will let pass through and what kinds they will keep out cooled and cushioned with lots of water over three-fourths of its surface, rotating fast enough on its axis once around every 24 hours, giving one side of the ship a chance to cool off while the other side heats up, giving one side a chance to rest while the other side works. Spaceship Earth does have a biosphere, a living sphere, and a most interesting one. Just imagine the excitement space travelers would feel if they had been traveling for years in the dark space between stars and suddenly they spied from afar this small blue spaceship with a deep warm glow of life. The biosphere, the living sphere that surrounds Earth is thin but tenacious. If you were to reduce everything to scale, the biosphere would be thinner than the thickness of the paint on a classroom globe. Inside this ever so thin shell, the only place in the universe so far that we know for sure, there is an immense and incredible, a staggering number of life forms that live and die. Passengers all on a well-designed, well-situated spaceship that has been self-sufficient for perhaps five to six billion years. It has only been in recent spaceship Earth years only the last hundred or so of over five to six billion years of Earth history that Earth scientists have led the way to a more subtle understanding of the intimate inner workings of this biosphere, discovering just how matter and energy did and still do manage to join together to produce this rare thing called life. Up till now, these subtle dynamics have worked automatically. That is, without, so far as we know, any conscious, intelligent tinkering. In our day, for the first time in the spaceship's history, one particular life form, human beings that is, have risen to assume some conscious guidance of this biosphere, hoping to guide it to serve human ends. In order to do this, it would be wise if we knew a little more about how the automatic systems have worked in the past and are still working today. Hence this instruction manual. Lesson one, the fundamental life cycling in the living biosphere seems to work something like this, with four principal divisions, producers, consumers, decomposers, and abiotic parts. The abiotic parts, to take the simplest one first, 
are things like air, earth, and water. Chemicals, in other words. To be more specific, chemicals like carbon dioxide, water, and simple mineral compounds containing nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, iron, magnesium, and about 15 or 20 more life-needed elements. These abiotic chemicals are just about the most plentiful elements in the universe, by the way, which is not so surprising, I suppose, when you come to think of it. Not so surprising, that is, that we should be made of the most common clay, so to speak. Better stick with the ordinary and easy to come by, rather than bank on the exotic, foreign, or hard-to-get items. Back to our diagram. Producers are almost all green plants and green plants alone. You see, green plants have a remarkable molecule in their cells called chlorophyll. And this chlorophyll is inside tiny cell parts called chloroplasts, which are usually in the leaf. With the aid of this molecule, green plants can perform quite a trick. Taking carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil, using radiant energy from sunlight as their power source, green leaves are able to tear apart and then weld back together the atoms from carbon dioxide and from water so that they come out with a whole new, much larger molecule called sugar. C6H12O6. That is, a molecule chain containing six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen. Sugar, you see, is packaged sunlight. Captured energy stored now in a chemical form that will prove most useful to all the living parts of the biosphere. Providing the basic energy to convert other abiotic molecules into flowers, into fruits and seeds, into teeth and eyes and brains. Once the green chlorophyll-aided plant leaf has turned the trick of making sugar, it can now proceed to diversify. Using the stored chemical energy of sugar as its source of fuel, the plant can manufacture all the other needed plant parts, such as proteins, enzymes, nucleic acids. These chemicals, in turn, are the parts needed to build new leaves, bark, roots, flowers, fruits, and seeds. In other words, the plants use some of the food they themselves made. Fortunately, they produce more than they use, and animals take advantage of this surplus by eating the plant parts, especially the most precious of the plant's storage bins, the fruits and seeds. Some animals have taken a further step in this direction by not eating just plants and plant parts, but by eating other animals or eating animals that have eaten animals. And so you get a whole pyramid of possible eats and be eatens. Note that in this pyramid, however, at each step up, there will be of necessity fewer living things, less biomass. If eagles eat big fish, and big fish eat small fish, and small fish eat water bugs, and water bugs eat green algae, there'll have to be quite a few more big fish than eagles, more small fish than big fish, more water bugs than small fish, and more algae than water bugs. At least 10 times as much with each step down the pyramid, as a matter of fact. That is, each creature is at best 10% efficient in converting the life he is eating into the life that is his own. Of course, there is a great deal of variation and complication in these living food chains. In Arctic oceans, it might be a very short and simple food chain. The blue whale eats great quantities of small shrimp-like crustaceans, which in turn get their life energy from eating the microscopic plant plankton, which gets its life energy by making its own food through photosynthesis with the help of the sun. Other ecosystems have more complex food chains. In a tropical rainforest, for instance, or on a Pacific island, or in a Wisconsin glacial lake, when you put many food chains all in one diagram, you get a food web 
that is still more complicated. Now food chains also change over time, sometimes quite rapidly. Lakes, for instance, are always changing. The Great Lakes of Mid-America, for instance, were formed in the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. When first formed, there was a minimum of dissolved abiotic nutrients. Microscopic plants used these nutrients to create food for smaller microscopic animals. These in turn were food for insect larvae and small crustaceans, which in turn fed small fish, which in turn fed a few large fish, like trout whitefish and walleyes. Well, as the lakes begin to age, the food chains change. With more dissolved nutrients, especially in the shallower lakes like Lake Erie, the abiotic base is richer in phosphates and nitrates. Different kinds of blue-green algae now become more plentiful and become primary producers. Well, these blue-green algae are poor food for the crustaceans Hence the insect larvae, small fish, and big fish, which depend on the insect larvae, also decrease in size and numbers. And we get a new, simpler food chain now, with blue-green algae at the bottom, the insect larvae replaced by small alewives fish, and these are eaten by larger alewives, and the few large trout and white fish left then become easier prey to parasites, like the imported lamprey eels. In all food chains and food webs, as one creature is eaten by another, which in turn is eaten by still another, you also get a surprising amount of selective concentration of certain kinds of atoms and molecules going on. For instance, you catch a beautiful trout in Clearwater Lake and find that, surprisingly enough, it has a concentration of PCB, polychlorinated biphenol, in its flesh that is 10,000 times as great as the waters of the lake in which it swims. What has happened? Each living step in the chain has selectively concentrated the PCB, mistaking it for a similar needed living chemical. And by the time it gets through five or six steps in the chain, the concentration of the harmful chemical can be enormously larger than its original abiotic environmental state. However complicated the food chains become, it is all in the consumer part of our larger scale cycling diagram. We still must somehow get back to the non-living chemical abiotic part. And we do this by way of the fourth main part, the decomposers. Decomposers are mostly microscopically tiny living creatures, such as bacteria, molds, fungi. These decomposers gain their life energy and glean their life materials by breaking down the still energy-rich chemicals of dead plants and animals, decaying them back to the dust from which they originally were born. In the naturally and automatically working biosphere, you see there is no such thing as waste or pollution. All parts are carefully picked apart and reused, recycled, over and over and over and over and over again. Of course, the parts, the chemicals, that is, are only one half of the story. To change these chemicals into life takes energy which flows but does not recycle. Here is a biosphere energy flow chart. Notice that it is one-way flow. It starts as sunlight energy and ends up as random heat energy, perhaps warming the universe, but useless for life, not recycled. The critical first step in the energy flow through the biosphere is the capturing of the sunlight energy by green plants in the process of photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide and water are changed into high energy sugar. The plant itself uses some of the energy of the sugar to provide the push for its own growth and metabolism and reproduction, for its own sedentary but elegantly beautiful lifestyle. The consumer animals then use some of the stored plant energy. And finally, the decomposers use what is left of the plant and animal energy after they die. 
But in all cases, in every use of their sun-stored energy, some of the energy gets lost. Some leaks away, so to speak, in the form of random heat. And this random heat simply drifts back out to space to warm the universe. Incidentally, it is exactly the same amount that came in from the sun originally, if measured in calories or watts or BTUs, but now it's deteriorated in quality. It's no longer intense, concentrated and ready for life sunlight, but it is diffuse, random, spread much too thin heat waves. In rough figures, as little as one hundredth of one percent of the annual sun-received energy that makes it to Earth actually gets trapped, actually gets captured as sugar by the photosynthesis of green leaves. And then less than ten percent of that hundredth of one percent gets used constructively to build consumer life. And at each step up the food pyramid, another ninety percent of what is left is lost. So that you can see, as you get 10% of 10% of 10% of 10% of one hundredth of 1%, you end up with very little energy. Or looking at from the other side, when you see an eagle or a large salmon or a cat or dog or human, you are looking at very concentrated energy indeed, super energy. Now, so far, we have looked only at existing food chains of today on this spaceship called Earth. Matter cycles and recycles through the producer, consumer, decomposer, abiotic paths. And energy flows from sun to green plants to animals to random heat sent out to warm the universe. But what about the past of spaceship Earth? These cycling food chains and energy flows have gone on for billions of years on Earth. One important modern legacy of past food chains is the stored energy that now powers our industrial societies. And that legacy is fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. In the Carboniferous Age, some 300 million years ago, Ancient plants captured energy from sunlight, just as plants do today. These prehistoric plants and the animals used most of that sun-stored energy for their own life activities, just as plants and animals, including humans, do today. Over a hundred million year time, however, some of these plants and animals died in ways and in places that prevented the decomposer organisms from completing their work. The plant and animal remains, in other words, were only partially decomposed. Instead of returning completely to the abiotic, they were buried under mineral and rock deposits and became coal veins and oil and gas deposits. Well, that long ago stored energy is now being used by modern power plants, automobiles, homes, and factories. That long ago stored energy is the very lifeblood of our modern civilizations everywhere on Earth. One problem. This rich legacy will not last forever. Within the 21st century, we will probably see a major portion of these stores of fossil fuels get used up and disappear. A second problem is that while the energy they contained drifts off into space as random heat, the matter, the chemicals of the fossil fuels, do not disappear. As we burn fossil fuels in our power plants, and our automobiles, homes and factories, these chemicals change partners and the carbon part of the fuel ends up combined with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide goes directly into the atmosphere, and if it is not taken out by green plants, or somehow sequestered in other ways, it will lead to a gradual warming of the atmosphere. This global warming could bring drastic changes in rainfall patterns, rising levels of ocean water, and serious disruptions in the lifestyles for all the living creatures on this planet. To cope with the first problem, the slow disappearance of fossil fuels, humans will have to find new ways to capture and store energy, 
if industrial civilization itself is not to disappear. One possible solution is to find new ways to capture more of the current sunlight energy. Green plants learned how to do this some billions of years ago in the invention of photosynthesis. Humans are now learning new ways to do it in the 21st century. Solar voltaic cells, for instance, like these on a new community project next to the post office in Madison, Wisconsin, directly convert sunlight into electricity. In one year, this small solar array can do the electrical generating work of six tons of coal in a coal-fired power plant. It can also save the atmosphere from having to soak up nine tons of carbon dioxide a year. The sun heats some parts of the earth more than others, and this creates winds. Windmills like these near Palm Springs, California, tap this solar power and do the work of many more tons of coal, oil, or gas in providing electricity to energy-hungry Los Angeles and add not a bit of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The sun lifts water up from the ocean. Dams like this one in Tennessee can harness the energy of this water as it falls back to the ocean, turning it into electricity and adding no carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Scientists and engineers are working today on other ways to create large amounts of energy that do not directly rely on the sun at all. These include geothermal power plants nuclear fission power plants, and nuclear fusion power plants that use no fossil fuels and add no carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Someday, scientists and engineers may even learn to duplicate the green plants trick. In other words, learn how to use energy, whether from the sun or from other sources, to make food. How to start with carbon dioxide, water, and common minerals and convert them in the laboratory first and then in a factory into sugar, starch, protein, vitamins, enzymes, into food. But until that day, we are all of us dependent on our friends, the green plants and the sun, to make our food and to power and to protect our living space, our biosphere. So some operating rules for small spaceships. Number one, be careful to nurture and protect green things. At the moment and for the foreseeable future, we depend on them as our only means of effectively capturing the sun's energy and storing power for the life and health of all the passengers. Number two, while nurturing and protecting green plants, try to figure out other ways to capture sunlight for the future health and safety of the spaceship. Better understanding of photosynthesis and better ways of directly converting sunlight into chemical or electrical energy seem the most promising at the moment. Number three, don't rule out tapping the energy of atoms themselves. That is, nuclear energy, the same energy that the sun uses. And number four, take time out occasionally to feel the sun's energy flow through you. For in the long run, energy is eternal delight.